This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks, Neil. And, uh, well, it looks like we, uh, we're competing against the knee here. Because uh, I was expecting a much, uh, 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 much emptier room. At least in Judea. I don't know what it looks like in, uh, in Ithaca. I'm General Fazio. I'm one of maybe five Appaloosa breeders in the world. Um, and, uh, uh, and they, they seem a to be diminishing. As, as time goes on. Um, I've been here in, uh, in Geneva since November 2001. I came straight uh, from Wisconsin, Madison, where I worked on partnership uh, breeding uh, in cucumbers for my uh, uh, PhD. And uh, previous to that, I worked on tomatoes, and disease resistance in tomatoes. So, um, that's pretty much my background. I, I was born in Italy, and I like, uh, if, you, if you put great knowledge in front of me, then I, I can easily down about two kilos of, of uh, grapes and perhaps half a kilo of olives in the city. <laughs> and my tummy feels. All right, so um, I guess since I introduced myself, I'm going to go on. I have about 80 slides. I'm going to be quick about it uh, with many of them. Is, is this okay? Is my stance okay? Mm -hmm. Is that count? Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> okay. So, um, the first slide is to acknowledge all of the people that work with the uh, Geneva Breeding Program, with my, uh, with, uh, with our program. Many collaborators all over the world, Cornell, Michigan State, Washington State, uh, you know, in the uh, PGRU, and uh, of course, uh, in Curtisville, the U.S. SDRS, Monachi, and uh, Penn State Universities. Uh, the NC140 collaborators all over the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and uh, and then other international collaborators, which I couldn't list. There are many. So um, I uh, tip my hat off to them because they have been instrumental in some of this work. And. Uh, uh, not least, or I need to I need to acknowledge the, uh, the people in my team that uh, uh, help us accomplish uh, the uh, our day to day and our big goals that, that uh, we're accomplishing. So David and Sarah and Todd and uh, the late Charlie, um, where his hands have been. Um, I've touched many trees that are in the ground now, and, and uh, have um, uh, and, and these trees are some of the source of this data that we're showing. And so, oh wow! About 100 years ago, things looked like this, and uh, uh, <coughs> and now they kind of look like this. You can see really. Uh, they, um, a site of one of my trials in uh, the old fruit farm in Vantage. And you can see fruit regularly uh, hung over a, uh, a canopy uh, with maximum light interception. They're using uh, modern methods of that. And their pack out here is uh, about 95%. It means 75% of these apples that get uh, harvested go into the grocery stores. So, uh, the difference that has occurred in, during this period of time is the implementation of dwarfing rootstocks. And I demonstrate the dwarfing right here. These two trees were planted at the same time, but they have different rootstocks. And uh, one is full of apples and it's tiny, the other one is big. It has produced a lot of wood and very few apples. Uh, and, uh, of course, less sprays, less letter accidents, increased productivity. On a percentage basis today, about 92% of apple rootstocks are um, dwarfing rootstocks. In contrast, it's about 45%, about maybe even less, uh, about 20 or 30 years ago. And every, every year, there are about 12 to 17 million trees uh, 
uh, that are planted. Um, the current systems that we adopt um, heavily rely on working root stocks for their success. So what do we ask a root system to do and not the root stock to do? It interfaces with the soil, root penetration, anchorage, soil chemistry, soil microbes, it competes with other uh, other things, it fights infections, it collects nutrients, transports them up. So we're asking quite a lot of things to, for, to the uh, 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 upper roots or the other rootstocks. And it has to survive in, uh, in climates that are sometimes adverse <coughs> to uh, uh, the uh, normal apples. Um, I may I presented this slide a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, from data from the uh, USDA um, Economics Research Service, and uh, I placed the amount of number of, of dwarfing roosters that were being planted in 1982 and, and now. Uh, in uh, 2007, and uh, made a straight line. Of course, this is 25 uh, tons per hectare. We were at 15 tons per hectare, but we're able to achieve in the best high density systems in here in New York, <coughs> thanks to Terry Strong, 100 tons per hectare. Okay, so, and these really rely on, on, uh, on working roof stock. So, I kind of decided to calculate a little bit of what what this what portfolios were worth to the U.S. industry, and, and I try to be as um, as conservative as possible. So I took the value, the 2007 crop value, and I said, well, you know, this increase. Let's say that not all of it is due to upper root stocks. Let's say that only half of it is due to uh, the uh, working root stocks. So based on the 2007 crop value, without any multipliers, I think it's a 20%, that's a 20% increase that we can attribute to the implementation of dwarf removal stocks. Well, it's $0.5 billion a year. That, uh, and, uh, and it's two to three genes that make and nine other dwarf removal stocks, what, what they do. So two, three genes are worth half a billion dollars a year, at least. I'm thinking more like a billion dollars. Perspective. What about fire blight? How much is fire blight worth to, uh, uh, to the industry? Well, some estimates, I, I've seen estimates for $10 million to $50 million dollars per year, because anytime you lose a tree, you have to replace the whole tree, and then there is the uh, economic loss of uh, misproduction for the rest of the, uh, uh, the rest of the, of the orchard. So, um, yeah, 10 to 50 million dollars a year. And the difference between an immune uh, fruit stock, P41, and M9, which is heavily susceptible, is probably the source of these losses, or many of these losses. Is about four to six feet. So that's about well, one to one to ten million dollars a year. A little historical perspective. I was not a twinkling in my parents' eye yet <laughs> when all of this started. So I have to recognize her Baldwin and Dr. Cummins as really having this this uh, vision for the future. In, uh, in developing disease-resistant apple root stocks. They were the only ones that had the vision to do it in the whole world. Everybody else was crossing uh, between uh, N9 clones and oh, well, uh, N9 relatives and so on and so forth, but no one really had that vision. So in 1968, this program started. The few, very first few releases, the first one was Noble, and then 365, 30, 11, 16, 202, 41, and 35, we released together uh, with USDA. And then these are the last releases, 214, 969, 890, 210, for the, uh, the last three for the New York industry, uh, processing industry. 
And of course, I joined in 2001. Um, so a little perspective of that. And then a little uh, uh, figure that uh, I think a lot of rulers like to know. They want to know how big does this root start or uh, make a tree. And uh, uh, so we have this nice figure of a range of different rootstocks that develop to forward. They're all fiber like resistant. Many of them are weak fiber resistant. This is uh, something that describes G214, one of our latest releases. Bigger, similar to M9, but more vigorous than M9 or M26. Highly yield efficient, about the same as M9 or more. And uh, um, productive fiber resistant. And it's one that has shown some. Uh, very, very strong big fiber resistance in organic soils in uh, Washington State. Uh, and you, you see it here, this is the same trial that I showed you before, and this is a fine root rate that we identified in P214 that we're studying in our breeding program. This is V11, another, another child of, of this program. Uh, very productive rootstock is being commercialized uh, in the U.S. and internationally, and uh, I believe it's, it's going to become uh, one of the staples of our breeding program. This is V41, another rootstock. Of course, I'm showing the tree, <laughs> but, so and, 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 and as you well know, the root is like is hidden, but it's doing all the work. <laughs> oh, sort of. Um, it, this rootstock is is. Uh, quite amazing as far as the number of disease resistance it has. Woody Apolifid, uh, reed plant, very cool hardy. Um, it is immune to fire blight. And uh, um, the grower in Washington State approached me in, at IFDA two weeks ago and he said, I'm not going to plant anymore in nine. I said, okay. Uh, uh, but I don't have any G41 available. So you're making me lose money. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay. Mm. Uh, the good news is that the production of, of these rootstocks is, is ramping up. So hopefully in, in the next few years, we'll see uh, millions of, uh, of P41, G11, P202, and, and, and the uh, newer species. This is a uh, slide that I took from Terrence Robinson, who uh, showed this. Um, so there is hope. The apple roots of breeding. I'm going to give you a few, uh, about 20 slides showing the different elements of the apple roots of breeding program and, and uh, what we're faced with every day. It's a very, very resource intensive uh, endeavor. It takes many years. We have lab and greenhouse components, uh, orchard production, and then nursery production. And those three things have to, those three activities have to uh, blend in together. And I, I'm grateful to uh, Sarah and, and Todd for being the, the, the uh, uh, leaders in, in, and really taking the, uh, the lab and greenhouse and uh, orchard work and nursery work. Um, uh, there's a right and reason to what we do, and it's all in this plan. I didn't expect you to read it. It's just um, it shows the different stages of the of the bidding program and how everything is pretty much planned out um, to achieve our goal, which is to release the best rootstocks in the world. This slide is to um, show that sometimes, well, for people that are used with uh, to uh, tomato or dopsis or you know, cucumber, corn. Um, where sometimes you can achieve three generations per year. Uh, it's not like that. Sometimes, well, hmm, you see some traits for the fire bike systems, it takes one to seven evaluation years to, uh, to actually try to get phenotype. And reef by disease comps, uh, complex just the same. Dwarfing, eight to 12 years for costy. Well, I think you can do it off four years, but I put eight there. Um, because we still have to keep the orchard for it, you know, for it. Um, so, stage one, three 
3,000 seedlings to 10,000 seedlings every year. We haven't done this in the past couple of years because we're just full of seedlings now. Um, but this is what you get. And this is thanks to Herb's lab in Gustafson. We kill as many as we can. Uh, so, you know, when my daughter asked me, Daddy, what do you do for work? I kill plants. No, I should be. Um, well, we do kill plants. That's the point. The next, next, uh, next stage, we did stage one. The next step is is fire by screening, and we uh, uh, inoculate the, the seedlings that survive with fire blight. Anything that has a strike, um, thanks to herbs lab, we eliminate. Then we have to plant these and propagate these in the in the field. And this is when I'm putting a price tag on these to let you know why we're trying to get markets and selection in our program or get markets and selection going in our program. So two dollars of seedlings a year doesn't seem much, but when you add up uh, a few hundred seedlings, it, 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 it makes it takes a toll. And for every single one of these, what we have to do is we have to do alpha propagation by layering. And if you're familiar with it, um, but uh, every single year, the root system picks out a, uh, a number of shoots. We layer uh, sawdust on each of them. The, the sawdust induces uh, the production of adventitious fruits, which we then, you know, this nice chainsaw, I haven't used a beautiful chainsaw, but uh, it makes a point. We cut them, and this is what we get apple rootstock liners, which we then uh, plant in the nursery uh, as individual plants or to and then graft them to make trees. Uh, here's Charlie, and uh, of course it costs their ten dollars and fifty cents per seed per year. It takes two years to develop a tree, so twenty dollars times. <coughs> what do we do? 2,000, 3,000 uh, uh, trees last year, uh, Todd? Uh, more than that, okay. Okay, so you, you, you get the picture of what's happening here. Um, and then all these trees have to be planted in the field and be evaluated, you know, with 3 to 10 replicates for the phenotype. And uh, usually we try to target about 100 different phenotype selections. They're all grafted with the same science. And this is what we get. Uh, we're evaluated for six to twelve years. Each tree or each seedling costs about fifteen dollars to maintain in the in the orchard every year. Um, then we do early field selections for precocious stream types, which is stage four, and uh, we evaluate things like burnout, which we don't like in the orchard, don't like in the nursery. Um, of course, those selections have to go into uh, stage four, which is we need to propagate more material because we need more application. And uh, uh, of course, that was twenty dollars per selection uh, per year. And now, as we increase the number of, of plants that we propagate, we get into a situation of Forty to two hundred dollars per selection per year. Two hundred million. This is what we get when we are doing evaluations. Uh, these are trees and rootstock liners that, uh, of course, have been harvested. And as continuing at stage five, we need a lot of replication to do inoculations with wood apple aphids, and we'll come to that. Uh, and how much the <laughs> using microsystem ingredient for this evaluation um, is worth. Um, so for every single test, water logging, fire logging locations, it costs 80 to 350 dollars per selection for every year. So the material that is passed uh, that passes those those tests uh, is planted in a in a uh, advanced Orchard or the replicated orchard trials in multiple locations. We have to course, multiply the material propagated, and we take um, 
measurements like recalcity, uh, suckering, yield efficiency, and so on and so forth. And this is an example of the uh, uh, statistics that we that, that we measure, that I conduct um, on uh, on these plants. Of course, here is the nine, which is our target, and we have a here that's more yield efficient than nine. We count suckers and uh, we try to breed against suckers, and then the uh, Material that it passes those tests gets placed in commercial stool bed trials in Washington State, uh, where things are, we don't pretend to be the best nursery, um, and, uh, and so we, we want to see how these foodstuffs perform in, uh, in a real commercial setting, so that uh, real nurseries can make money off. And then we have, uh, at the same time also, we have field trials all over the U.S. and, and sometimes the world. So this is an example of NCM 40 collaborators, uh, numerous field trials that have been planted that continue to be planted all over. And we try to, uh, as I try to visit some of these trials, it's important to, to uh, look at the performance, the performance of, of uh, trees, uh, because numbers sometimes don't give them give the right uh, the right image. At this stage, we also conduct very advanced tests for graph dollar tolerance, for example, <coughs> uh, graph union strength because graph union strength is important. We uh, look at uh, the uh, tree architecture of the trees. Uh, now we know that some of the uh, genotypes in the reading program have a tendency to induce flat branching. branching. Um, as you can see here in uh, nursery in Delaware, we had these uh, trees planted in the in, uh, uh, replication. This is JTEB, uh, I mean, non flat branching loose and this is G935 on the loose to release. And you can see that uh, amazing. This is the same sign, it's not something different. And this, that flat branching is just caused by. Stuff. And we have mapped uh, flat branching in, uh, in that population. So, what's the motivation for markers of breeding? Oh, it's economics and it's efficiency. As you can see uh, in, in the different stages of the breeding program, I just listed five stages, there are ten stages, but in the five stages, we go from a large number of genotypes and we try to cut those genotypes down uh, as much as possible. But still at stage three, we have a uh, quite a large number of genotypes that enter the uh, the pipeline, uh, and they cost fifteen dollars and fifty cents, and the times nine years. Um, and that's money. That's money that the breeding program has to come up with to, uh, to, uh, uh, to do it. But if we were able to utilize, Marcus is a breeding for. Four unlinked loci. Now I did four unlinked loci. You could do two or three or or seven. But take the information that we have developed from stage five, for example, the ammonia polyter resistance information, and find uh, and you utilize that information uh, with molecular markers and select here at stage two, we decrease this pipeline quite a bit and result in cost savings and sneaker cost, cost savings throughout the year. Okay, so now the $60 molecular marker reaction doesn't look like that expensive, um, you know, compared to the $250 uh, or maybe $400 per genotype that it costs to keep it going until stage five, which, which we uh, currently do. So developing a marketing uh, strategy um, has been kind of the goal of my uh, um, my breeding program, our breeding program, and we try to combine genomic tools, markers, map sequences, and microarray, the alleles, which are actually what is what is causing uh, or causing the diversity and the effects that we see in the field. And then phenotypes and populations that we have. We have uh, many different crosses, and, uh, and so many different populations and, and very different phenotypes in, in these 
cross uh, segregating. Um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to get accurate and repeatable measure, measures of, of, of the, the uh, human species. And then we'd like to follow this, this pattern, discovery, validation, and then implementation. Right now, we're mostly in the validation process, and uh, we're going to be in the implementation process <coughs> in about two months. Right, Sarah? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, since 2001, we developed um, the capacity. There was no capacity for molecular markers in apple rootstocks, uh, at least in the, in the, in the breeding program. So we developed simple sequence for bees, AFFBs, SNPs, uh, and uh, using the high resolution mapping as, as a means to uh, detect SNPs. Uh, bank libraries, we didn't develop microarrays, someone else developed them, and, and uh, we uh, piggybacked on, on their use and collected them. So we, um, and then lately, we've done a little bit, only $3,000 and this $3,000 is, is becoming worth, of, it's going to be worth a lot of money for the breeding program. Uh, so we sequenced uh, G41. Ten years ago, that would have been unheard of. A genome for $3,000? Now it's like, it's possible, and I'm, I'm going to sequence more. But we got 81 million reads uh, for G41, and we have a back library of G41, that uh, Kenong has been using in, uh, in, his, in his program. And uh, those have been very, very valuable tools. Back on. Perhaps one of the most valuable things that we've been able to do in our green program, uh, and that has paid off already many times over, the investment in markers, is uh, the identification of unknown and mixed material. I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, about four years ago, we began the process of, of uh, propagating G41 by tissue culture, and we distributed the material to several uh, micropropagation nurseries for them to take explants of the material and, uh, and to uh, propagate into Hundreds of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of plants. Uh, after about a year and a half, of that process, um, the nursery called me and, and uh, told me that they had about, uh, oh, they had close to you know, a few hundred thousands of plants, and uh, and they said, uh, you know, we're ready to go commercial on this. And I said, well, great, let's do some genetic testing on on the material. And uh, lo and behold, I said, well, you know, everybody else was having poor success with, with G41 because it's very finicky with, uh, with the uh, uh, propagation or micropropagation. Uh, and uh, I said, let's do some genetic testing. And we did. We found out that it wasn't G41, it was something different. Now, when I delivered these plants, of G41 to, to nurseries, I had delivered them uh, in, a, in a specific way. They were uh, science on a, on a seeding rootstock to maintain virus-free status because these <coughs> I wanted to maintain uh, the certification of the virus-free status of the, of, the, of the rootstock. And of course, I had made sure I had not don't take any material below the graft union. And, well, someone did. And we were able to identify the specific plant. This is actually work that Sarah did. And we were able to identify, I, I flew over to California, collected the samples from each individual plant, and we were able to identify the specific plant that was the cause of the, uh, uh, the mix-up. And identified the seed that contributed to the uh, these Tens of thousands, tens of thousands of plants. So it paid off. Um, alleles, functional genetic variation. So in in our, in, our, in the breeding program, uh, <coughs> when we look at the source of dwarfing and percussion.
Kosinski. It's fairly strict. It's a number of, of genotypes in this cluster right here. The are the Molly series, or the Molly cluster. So these are functional needles for, are the source of the functional needles for morphine and for Kosinski. And uh, of course, they're very restricted. They, in, the, in the Geneva Reading Program, which is represented here, and in some places around here, is the novel. Um, we have expanded on, on that really diversity, but we still want to keep these alleles going in our reading program because they're so important. We saw how much portion was worth. So within the program, we tested a lot of uh, um, markers. Of course, we uh, were we have been looking for working in mercosity. We've been looking at disease resistance, fire life, and then any other marker that we had uh, that was available in the literature, we um, developed in Florida and we tested a number of what I call a, a diversity array of apple rootstocks to see what uh, what the segregation is, what the presence of those uh, of those markers was in in that. Uh, in, in this group of rootstocks, actually a little bigger than that. Um, and to also discover new new gene pools, novel material that we could use for different sources. Of course, not everything in the literature shows up as being useful. Um, so we have this marker for Polyapolyte resistance, which was developed by a group in New Zealand, and uh, it cannot, it's a, it's a microcellular that cannot differentiate between BUD9, M9, and OX5, which is resistant control. So, eh, what do we do with it? Well, we don't utilize it, but without testing it and, and validating it in our reading program, we wouldn't know that. Uh, this is an example of another marker for. The ER2 gene derived from the of 5, which is very important in our reading program. And um, of course, the story here was is it's been published. The, the marker had uh, um, <coughs> well, it, it, it showed up as being not very useful to the reading program because of no fields and, and other other elements that uh, were in the publication. For example, its location was it, it, this. The, uh, the gene was misplaced. Uh, this is the uh, taken from the publication of Bas et al. in 2008. Uh, ER2, which is, of course, worth quite a bit of money to be able to select uh, early on. And uh, this is the real location based on the sequence by the last one in 2010. And of course, we had tried to use GD153 and GD96 as the flanking markers, which we possess in our reading program and have worked very well. We tried to use those and found out that, mm, guess what, they're not flanking and they're very far away from the field. So in the next few slides, I'm going to come back to this and, and I'm going to come back to our effort to actually come up with the best possible markers for ER2. Um, so to discover the best possible markers, we uh, utilized or we set up a mapping population, um, a segregating population with uh, about 186 probably here, it says 183, but the, the parents were Oliver 5, Oliver 3 and Vasa 5. These two parents have yielded about 70% of the releases in the, in, uh, in the US, in the reading program. So it, it's been a very, very successful cross, very good specific combining ability uh, because of uh, the uh, different traits that, that uh, each parent possesses. It was planted in Geneva in 2003, and we, thanks to the, the work of HM1, who laid the foundation of, for this map, uh, we, uh, we uh, essentially had this linkage map for Cross and it, we have used it now to uh, to discover um, things, uh, elements, those that are that are linked to to about uh, 
25 different traits, 25 different important traits. But uh, during during this process, during the years, uh, in the last several years, we um, lines from this population were used to do phenotyping experiments in uh, collaboration with Herb Alvis, uh lab for fire and light, for powdery building resistance for root architecture and administration and nutrient translocation, for root submergence with Kinon Chu, for Kowski and for dwarfing and several others. For example, flat branching is one of those things that we have mapped in this population. It takes a lot of work to, uh, to uh, do phenotyping. And uh, <coughs> the story is garbage in, garbage out, if you don't do correct phenotyping, and you put that in the QTL analysis, you're going to come up with junk, or nothing. Um, but it takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of effort and replication. And here's uh, David Strickland making uh, pictures of, of roots, which are then analyzed, and you get numbers and distributions, and you can plug those into a, a QTL uh, discovery um, to come up with low site and yields that affect the trade. Excuse me. So we collected data on about 80 plus trades in the past few years. And we utilized MacQTL6 software. It's a very, very nice package. Uh, uh, for trade discovery and, and it allows you to, to do some fancy things like take the cofactor analysis and uh, use multiple uh, uh, related trades in the analysis to come up with the best possible location for your TTLs. Um, of course, we plotted the results in charts. This is an example of the uh, fine root trait that's part of this 42-14 root stock, and it's segregating in our population. This is the phenotype, and these are the QTLs, so the QTL locations for the phenotype. And for each, uh, for each allele that belongs to the uh, in this phenotype, um, so these are individual loci that we utilize or that were uh, important for uh, this trait. So for each allele, we can actually measure the contribution of the allele to the phenotype. So at this location, there is a production of, I guess, five more primary, total primary units uh, given the presence of this particular allele, uh, microcellular allele. And you know you can you can uh, see that one parent the, the alleles that are contributed by one parent are not doing much versus the alleles that are contributed by the other parents are actually doing the work. And sometimes these are it's the other parent that's contributing alleles that modify the trait. And so you have com uh, combina uh, combinatory ability here, the uh, specific combination. And of course, selecting for the best combinations for the highest possible uh, performance of, of that trade is something that we try to do. So about, um, about at the end of my, close to the end of my PhD in Wisconsin, I, I was theorizing about uh, marker assisted breeding about segregating population and things, and I said, wouldn't it be cool if, um, if microarrays had, uh, had just barely started to come out at that, at that moment? Uh, um, they had been out for a while, but the, the big, the big aftermatrix and the day just barely started to come out. And I said, wouldn't it be cool <coughs> if, we took, if we took microarrays and use the segregating population to challenge these microarrays, uh, hybridize the microarrays, and then find out what the um, expression 
or where the expression QTLs are, are mapping to in, in, in the population. And uh, well, the dream slowly came through. This is a paper that laid the foundation for for this uh, for the, the, this type of research. Um, Mac Tim McNellis and Phil Jensen developed a microarray for Apple that uh, has, a, has about uh, 26,000 unigenes. Of course, that this represents now half of the entire Apple Apple um, Express gene sequence, because as we know now, there are about 50,000. Uh, but still, it's 26,000. And uh, uh, it's internally replicated three to six times. Uh, so the data that comes out of, of, of this, of this uh, nimble generator is, is pretty good. And uh, through this collaboration with Tim McNellis and, and Phil Jensen, uh, we took 48 of the lines from on the auto 3 to the 5 population and uh, uh, extracted the RNA from, uh, uh, from shoot tips and then uh, hybridized it to the, uh, to the microarrays. And thanks to the work that uh, um, David Strickland did with, with my guidance, and he was able to uh, conduct uh, about 26,000 QTL analysis for each individual. So each individual <coughs> pattern, uh, expression pattern, placed it into the uh, on that QTL and, and you know, stored out where the expression um, of a particular gene was being modulated uh, in the apple genome. And then we grouped everything by uh, groups. Now, the two questions that I, that of course I have in the reading program is, is the EQTL that comes out of here is the haplotype in cis configuration of the trait, <coughs> meaning that is, is the EQTL segregating with the trait? Is the expression <coughs> being upregulated or downregulated with the trait? Um, is cis or is it, you know, or, or just because there are some things that just could happen to be in the same location. And then the second question that I have in developing markers is there polymorphism in in this cis configuration. So this is what the uh, data looks like. Uh, the, each, the, the expression data looks like for uh, these individuals. And you can see many types of distribution. You can see a bimodal here, here, uh, kind of like a trimodal here, uh, and then the normal distribution in uh, many other cases here. So kind of like a cross-zone. Uh, not really. Um, but every single one of these uh, genes has been mapped to the group 17, where the one epilate resistance is, in fact, is within one megabase of the one epilate resistance. So these are candidate genes now for one epilate resistance. And what I'm looking for is perhaps something that is expressed all the time, that's not expressed as susceptible and expressed in, in the resistant material. Uh, something that makes wood appellations uh, go good, you know. Um, but, and even if eight out of these turn out to be the gene, it puts me close to, to, that, to that gene so that uh, I can mark it and select for it uh, regardless. Um, of course, we, we have, uh, we can look at gene families and, and uh, or create gene families by the way these EQTLs are segregated. Uh, so here we have uh, in family that is associated with uh, uh, one of the dwarfing genes or genes that are close to dwarfing. Um, so we can actually study <coughs> fit, 
Phil Jensen actually did uh, some work with uh, um, the anthocyanin genes, where he put together all the all the pathway, and lo and behold, they cluster, and it was pretty cool to see how a couple of genes mod modulated the pathway. So um, I tested uh, an easy one in our, uh, in our in this population. Uh, this is the QTL for primary milk resistance uh, phenotype on linkage 12. It's been published. We have markers that, that work, but we want to test. And then we'll see uh, if we could. So this is the QTL in our population. You can see that a large score of about 40 tells you that it's got a very, very strong effect. For, for those of us that are QTL, uh, not the QTL jargon. Um, this is a QTL for Apple FR0004889, and a nice lot score of 15. Of course, a significant lot score is down here. Um, so we're pretty confident that we're seeing that we're, we're seeing what we're seeing, and, and it is this particular. Uh, QTL is in cis configuration with the resistance. And so we look at the uh, uh, that factor and we, we look at our population, this is of this course of poverty mildew resistance. So uh, close to 100% here is the uh, susceptibility and zero is, is, the, is the resistance. And uh, and this is the expression of that particular gene. Of course, there are some outliers, but hey, if you didn't have outliers, things wouldn't be true. <laughs> um, so we're, we're actually studying those outliers to see what, um, if, if they're uh, really outliers or uh, just mismanaged data. So we, um, you can create a matrix plot of the expression of that gene um, and compare it to, uh, to the pyrrhine uh, resistance. So here's that gene, here's the pyrrhine, uh, uh, plotted against the pyrrhine resistance. And we can see that other genes are correlated uh, perhaps with uh, uh, to that particular one. And uh, so with this exercise, we're looking for things that are being activated or inactivated in the cascade events of pyrimidal resistance. We have a nice apple sequence now, published by the Italian group. Uh, this is the uh, sequence, uh, for example, for linear group 17, or at least the upper portion of linear group 17. So we can take the sequence of the uh, of those genes and Put them on the map, on, on the uh, on the on the real sequence, and thanks to thanks to the sequencing of G41, um, which is body mill resistant and body resistance uh, resistant, we can find out these are a bunch of uh, Illumina sequences that um, have. Uh, um, of, of, uh, have been aligned to the uh, to the uh, apple genome. Uh, we can find the individual SNPs. Probably a little bit tired. First. We can find the individual SNPs, and uh, here is the uh, alignment of the two haplotypes of P41 for that particular gene. And you, we can see that uh, in these locations, there are um, uh, a number of, of, of SNPs. And we can design primers. And these primers amplify. This is, this is the same um, uh, right here. This is the same amplicon. And these primer primers amplify only the resistant material. And they're haplotype specific. That's what we'd like to. That's what we'd like to see. Um, so, in selection using genetic tests, what we'd like to have is perhaps a multiplex of these types of, of markers, um, and of course, plant one, plant two, plant three, plant four, plant three thousand. Uh, we'd like to combine.
combine these uh, these loci in the individual plant. So these are the target targets for our marker system breeding. Uh, it's an ongoing process. We have more targets that I haven't shown you here. You sign a non-disclosure agreement with me. In the final. Um, but uh, uh, I think we, what we what we will start with, or what we're starting with, is exactly this polyethylene uh, resistance gene, which will cut down our population by half. And then once we, uh, I don't I don't think that we'll need much validation because of the uh, surety of of that marker. We will really validate it essentially. And then the next uh, markers will probably be working and, and things. And maybe powdery mills will be, will be the very last one. So the future, given our current budget prices, just like everybody else, we're, we're probably going to downsize our orchards based on the three to five low side. We need to focus on discovering, validating, and, implement, and implementing different traits. And uh, we'd like to continue phenotypic analysis of, uh, of multiple uh, uh, trades in, in, in commercial and advanced unique uh, and uh, uh, I, I hate to say this but I, I didn't I didn't put much data here of our work in utilizing the, the collection apple collection here in Geneva, but it's been essential to have that here in Geneva, and it's been an enormous tool. And uh, we, last year we conducted a uh, <coughs> characterization experiment <coughs> where we looked at root types in uh, Malus subversia, and we found, lo and behold, we found a lot of segregation, a lot of different architectures. So we want to find out what, what the uh, what the use of that is, we already have crosses. Now we, we need to find out how useful those root architectures are to the growers. How much money is it worth to, to the growers to, uh, to have these beans? Finally, if the budget permits us, we'd like to do some more next-gen sequencing of, uh, of founder lines of the breeding program. So. Did G41? Well, you know, it would be nice to, to have uh, uh, Oliver 3, or it would be nice to have Bud 9 sequence for a reason. So we can find the alleles, uh, more alleles for, for what we need, or what we're looking for, and haplotypes specifically for developed markers. Finally, this is a uh, rose of commercial approach to G41. We Hope to have millions of business plant and nine in the in the near future. Uh, contrary to what people say, it does root, um, and uh, this is the truth. But of course, you have to be a professional professional nurseryman to do it. I'd like to thank all of you for listening to me, and hopefully, I'm on time. I'm, I didn't keep track of the time, uh, and uh, I recognize that. Rosa head is a little bit curvy, <laughs> but anyway, she's taking a nice Ferrari on this. <laughs> it's fun. And I'll take it fresh. Oh, thank you.
recovering uh, drought tolerance, uh, come on over. <laughs> yes, Ben. To what extent is this knowledge of markers in apple rootstocks transferable to uh, quince pear or prunes? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I, uh, I believe that it's possible that the precocity genes or the genes that have been modified for precocity may be transferable uh, and may, may be in a similar pathway as as, uh, as precocious pairs, if, you know, if there are any, or early flowering pairs. Um, the, uh, these genes may possibly be used for transgenic approaches, um, but Really, apple and pear, the genomes are very similar, so there may be similar things segregating it, but uh, they've been, they've, they've evolved independently for quite a while, so who knows? Yes, Kenan. Can you tell us a little bit more about the YouTube there, and you talk about? I wonder when your samples tissues right. how many time points samples or we we uh, we didn't do any time sampling. This is so this is a one uh, one time sampling and uh, during the day and uh, in the middle of the summer, I think it was June must have been uh, June twenty sixth or so. The, uh, the roosters were actively growing, and uh, uh, that's that's the sample. And we sampled shoots, so the shoots were cut from the uh, from the, uh, the top of the uh, rooster plants and frozen uh, right away. So you are looking for something that is experienced fascinating, and uh, that that. that Right, I'm looking for things that, that are expressed differentially based on polymorphism, based on the segregation of genes, not, not off of a particular treatment. Yes? Uh, it makes the plant uh, 
top role earlier in the season than, than a non dwarfing uh, Bruce Scott. One more does question. Does that answer your question? It does. One more question, if you don't mind. Uh, one of the tests you were doing was a, a graft strength test. Is that an indication of incompatibility or, or something else? <laughs> Uh, the answer to that is maybe yes. Um, depends on what you define by incompatibility. Um, something that we've seen in uh, different species uh, or in this specific material is, is that the uh, The wood structure is different, and we see uh, some brittleness of, uh, of roots, and uh, um, and of course at, at the juncture, because of, of two uh, of two separate genotypes, you have one genotype that may be more brittle than the other, and of course the more brittle material is going to break. Uh, faster. So, uh, to answer your question, yes, it may be compatibility, but it may also be the brittleness of the wood of the rootstock that we are in. Okay, thank you. Any other questions in Ithaca? I think. Okay. Looks like we have no more here. Okay, we have one more from Alan Maxwell. Okay. So you've been looking at some of the different architectures. So if I showed you uh, two root systems, that, you know, one very finely branched, another one sort of on, on the roots or something, can you tell much about, or can you predict much about the behavior of the root stock or the design of that? Give me $200,000 and I will. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. We, we, we kind of have, we kind of have, and that's, we kind of have an, an idea of what it may do, but really, uh, it's it's a black box right now because it, the, the particular trait may have implications in nutrition, in replant tolerance, and all sorts of other things. And and again, we're dealing with groups, and it takes a lot of money and effort to do uh, a conclusive study of that. So we have some evidence, but it's. Publisher. Jay? Are all of your modern rootstocks uh, susceptible to virus problems? Uh, no. So we had one that, that, that is really susceptible to viruses, which is B16, which derived its susceptibility from uh, Malus floribunda. Um, but, uh, and then we have somewhat of differential susceptibility in other populations um, that we have discovered. For example, the, the, the same other of the the five population seems to be susceptible to one of the latent viruses. Uh, we can map it. Uh, we haven't mapped it yet, but we can map it, uh, map the susceptibility. Uh, and and it's, in, it's, it's one of the uh, traits that's in the, in the pipeline. We have to get the infected wood from the orchard where we saw the symptoms and bring it here and the grafting and then plant it and watch it for three years. Okay. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.